As we go through today's PowerPoint, make sure to have your review packet out with you. You should be able to fill in a few terms and questions on that packet. Today's conversation is about the Counter or Catholic Reformation. The Catholic Reformation was a vigorous reform movement that took hold within the Catholic Church. The leader of this movement, known as Pope Paul II, would use a council of advisors and other methods to stop the spread of the Protestant faith. If you were Protestant, you called this movement the Counter-Reformation. If you're Catholic, you called it the Catholic Reformation. Ultimately, the goal of the Catholic Church was to not only strengthen some of the core traditions of the church, but to also spread Catholicism throughout Europe and beyond. And furthermore, and probably most importantly, was to stop people from converting to Catholicism to a different faith. To establish the direction that reform should take, the Pope called the Council of Trent in 1545. It would meet on and on for the next 20 years. Their goal was to help direct church reform. How would that look? What were the steps that were going to be taken? How would they do this throughout the entire Catholic empire, if you will? Their other goal was to reaffirm traditional Catholic views. There seemed to be some agreement that during the Protestant Reformation and previous to that, especially during the Renaissance, things had gotten kind of away from traditional Catholic values, and they wanted to ultimately bring it back to their basis. They did, however, reaffirm some traditional Catholic views, which the Protestants had actually tried to challenge. They reaffirmed the belief that your salvation or your ability to get to heaven only came through your faith and good works. That was the only way. They also further reaffirmed that the Bible was a major source of religious truth. However, it was not the only source, as they had previously stated. Furthermore, the penalties for maybe being a priest or even a pope um, that was too worldly or corrupt, those started to increase. They started to work on ending some of the abuses that the church had had in previous centuries. They also established schools to better educate their clergy, ultimately to make sure that their clergy knew how to read and could understand church doctrine and therefore share it with their parishioners. That was really a major criticism of the Protestant Reformation was that so many of these clergymen did not understand the Bible and weren't really sharing the doctrine the way they should have. So that was something that the church wanted to address going forward. Sometimes the Catholic Church decided to take on the Protestant threat a little bit more directly than in some of the other rulings that they come up with. One of the ways they tried to combat the spread of Protestantism or people converting to the Protestant faith is they had what was called the Roman Inquisition. Now, to be real, this picture refers to the Spanish Inquisition, which happened several hundred years beforehand, but it's a funny picture from my Nathan Python, so we go with it. Uh, but what they decide to start is the Roman Inquisition, which really related to people living particularly in Italy. You could potentially get ruled for being a heretic, which means you're going against church teachings. If that happened, they would put you on trial in front of a church Inquisition court, and if found guilty, you could potentially be condemned to death, kind of like this picture you see here, being burned at the stake or apparently as this one is being just tossed into a fire. One of the other things they tried to do to kind of root out people that were perhaps heretics was they had what was called the Index of Forbidden Books. And that was a list of works, could be books, could be essays, that were considered too immoral or not religious enough for Catholics to read. As you might not be surprised to find out, it included books by Luther and John Calvin because they didn't want Catholics reading the works of other Protestant leaders. One thing you should keep in mind is that while the church really doesn't promote the Index of Forbidden Books anymore, they do kind of have it in existence. In fact, as early as uh, the 2000s or late 1990s when Harry Potter books came out, they were, in some Catholic circles, books that 
they did not want children to read because it dealt with sorcery and magic and perhaps that's the dark arts and things like that. So the Catholic Church still tries to, even in modern era, um, persuade people not to read certain things. In 1540, the Pope decided to recognize a new religious order called the Society of Jesus, which were also known as the Jesuits. This group was found by a man named Ignatius of Loyola, and he initially was a Spanish knight. Uh, he was busy in his early years fighting in various crusades, and after a leg injury, he found comfort in reading about saints uh, who had overcome uh, mental and physical torture. From that point on, he was inspired to become a soldier of God, and he drew up a very strict program for young men known as the Jesuits. If you became a Jesuit, you focused on spiritual and moral discipline, rigorous religious training, and absolute obedience to the church. This group, which was initially led by Ignatius, embarked on a crusade to defend and spread the Catholic faith throughout the world. To further their cause, Jesuits became advisors to Catholic rulers. They helped combat heresy in their lands. They set up schools that taught humanist and Catholic beliefs and enforced discipline and obedience amongst their followers. Some Jesuits actually even slipped into Protestant lands in disguise to minister to the spiritual needs of Catholics that were having trouble getting ministry there. Jesuit missionaries spread their Catholic faith to distant lands, including Asia, Africa, and the Americas. In fact, in the United States today, we have several universities that were founded off of Jesuits, like Marquette, Xavier, University of Chicago, and some of the various loyal universities. As the Reformation spread, many Catholics experienced a renewed sense of intense feelings in regards to their faith. Teresa of Avila symbolized this renewal. She was born into a wealthy Spanish family, and she entered a convent in her youth. She found that the convent routine was not strict enough, so she decided to set up her own order of nuns. They lived in isolation, and they ate and slept very little and dedicated themselves to prayer and meditation. Impressed by her spiritual life, her superiors in the church asked Teresa to reorganize and reform convents and monasteries throughout Spain. She would become widely honored for her work, and after her death, the church canonized her, which meant that they made her a saint. Her mystical writings rank among the most important Christian texts of her time and are still read in seminary schools and convents around the world. So ultimately, we need to ask ourselves, did the Catholic Church go far enough with, it re with its reforms? Would it be enough to stop the spread of Protestantism, and would it ultimately be enough to save the faith? In some regards, people think that that did in fact change. We know that by the 1600s, Rome was far more devout than it had actually been during the 1500s. And across Catholic Europe, piety, or your faith, and charity seemed to start to flourish. The reforms did seem to slow the tide of the Protestant wave of followers and even returned some areas of Europe back to the Catholic Church. Still, Europe remained divided into a Catholic South and a Protestant North, which is why Catholic missionaries really became important to spreading the faith to a larger audience outside of Europe. And that's really why people credit the fact that nowadays the largest population of Catholics in the world come from Latin America, which is also probably why your new Pope is from that region. Despite reformations uh, on both ends, whether it be the Protestant or the Catholic, this whole entire era really gave kind of birth to a heightened sense of passion and persecution. Both Catholics and Protestants fostered intolerance. Catholic mobs attacked and killed Protestants, and Protestants in turn killed Catholic priests and wrecked Catholic churches. Both Catholics and Protestants persecuted radical religious groups like the Anabaptists. Anabaptists would be people that are Baptist or Methodist. Certainly one of the things to come out of this would be the witch hunts. There are estimates that between 1450 and 1750, tens of thousands of women and men were killed as victims of various witch hunts. And we know that a number of those also come out of North America and the Massachusetts area. Scholars have offered various reasons for this persecution. At the time, most people believed in magic and spirits, and they saw a close link between magic and heresy, or going against church teachings. In addition, during times of trouble, people often looked for scapegoats, someone they could blame their problems on. 
People would often accuse uh, people of being witches if they were social outcasts, like beggars or poor widows or midwives who were blamed for the death of infants and birth, or even people that uh, made potions to help people uh, that were ill. Those were seen as gifts from the devil. Most of the victims of the witch hunts died in the German states or Switzerland and France. When all the wars of religion came to an end, however, the persecution of witches also declined. Another group that faced further persecution would be the Jews. The Reformation brought hard times to Europe's Jews. Many Jews lived in Italy, and during the early Renaissance, it had been a good time. Unlike Spain, which had expelled the Jews, Italy allowed Jews to remain. Some Jews followed traditional trades that they had previously been restricted to. Unfortunately, as time went on, you started to see a increase of discrimination. For example, by 1516, Venice ordered Jews to live in a separate quarter of the city, which became known as a ghetto. Other Italian cities also forced Jews into walled ghettos. During the Reformation, restrictions on Jews actually increased. At first, Luther hoped that Jews would be converted to his teachings. However, when they did not convert, he called for them to be expelled from Christian lands and for their synagogues and books to be burned. In time, some German princes did expel Jews. Others confined Jews to ghettos, requiring them to wear a yellow badge if they traveled outside. In the 1550s, Pope Paul IV placed added restrictions on Jews. Even Emperor Charles V, who had initially supported toleration during, of Jews in the Holy Roman Empire, banned them from the Spanish colonies in the Americas. After 1550, many Jews migrated to Poland, Lithuania, and to parts of the Ottoman Empire, where they were prom permitted to prosper. Dutch Calvinists allowed Jewish families who were driven out of Portugal and Spain to settle in the Netherlands. So when it's all said and done, the real big question is, did it get easier to celebrate your faith and to practice your faith? In some areas, yes, and, and quite often in many areas, no. So hopefully this helped you with your study guide um, and gave you a better understanding of what really the counter and Catholic Reformation was and what that kind of meant for many different religious and social groups.